Uh, SABC News uh, politics editor Mzwandi Lempeje is uh, sitting down with uh, Democratic Alliance leader John Stienhazen uh, in Bruma, Johannesburg. Let's take you live there for that discussion. Well, thank you very much, uh, Flo, and of course, uh, a very good afternoon to the viewers. Uh, we are indeed uh, sitting down with the leader of the DA, uh, John Steenhazen. Uh, you would know that uh, in the matter of four days, uh, the DA will be going for their National Elective Congress, uh, where he is actually contesting for a second term. And of course, we'll also touch on um, other issues really that affect the country, because remember, this is the official opposition. So they are hoping that next year, they probably be able to snatch it uh, from whoever is governing, which is currently the ANC. Uh, Mr. John Steen Hazen, thank you very much for agreeing uh, to have a sit down with us. And of course, a very important uh, week for you as the DA. Very important week. We put a big uh, stall on uh, internal democracy, and uh, this is obviously every three years we have a federal congress where the party's membership gets to decide who's going to lead it. But yep. this is an important one because who wins this particular congress will be the leader that leads us into that very important 2024 election, which I think is going to be a game changer for South Africa. Uh, that leader who's going to be leading the DA? Well, I, I'm very happy with the way my campaign has gone so far. I think I've done what needed to be done. A few more finishing touches as we sprint towards the finish line. Yeah. But I think I've been able to connect with the people that matter most in this particular uh, uh, instance, and that's the delegates attending the Congress. And I've been able to make contact with them. I've run, uh, I think, a positive campaign focused on a vision for the future yeah. of not only the DA, but also for the country. Why do you think uh, delegates should elect you for the second term? Well, for a number of reasons. First yeah. of all, going into an important election, you need a leader who's got the experience of having served in all three spheres of government and a leader who inherited a party that was in a terrible state in 2019 and has been able to, with teamwork, be able to pull that right again to the point where polling now shows we're 10 percentage points behind the ANC in some instances. That would have been unimaginable in 2019 when people were writing the DA off, said that we were, you know, the death of the DA was the, the headline, I think, in one News 24 article. Uh, and I think we had, the DA is, is back in business. And I think that's been a, a very, very positive sign. I think it's positive for the country. And nobody can talk about building the post-ANC yeah. South Africa that doesn't have the DA at the heart of it. I think a couple of days ago uh, in the Western Cape, you lost by election mm. to the ANC. Correct. So is that growth? Um, well, there was specific local circumstances there where we had had to fire a number of councillors who had broken the party line. Now, it would have been very easy just to leave them in, 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 case, but in, in place, but ill discipline uh, is really one of the things that plagued the pre-2019 DA, and we've taken a very strong line uh, against that. So there were some local circumstances there. But I think if you look at the overall trend of the by-elections, without singling out any particular one, that you will see that the trend has been backed up in some instances towards 2016 figures. Uh, but also a remarkable growth in some areas. Uh, recently in an in, in award in Cape Town in Yanga, we were able to think, treble our vote there. Uh, in one of the uh, VDs in Queenstown, um, completely uh, area where we had very little votes before, we were able to uh, grow our support 500%. So these are positive signs. But in some instances, mm -hmm. talking about the by-elections, mm -hmm. and I know in some of areas in KZN, you've stood back and then allowed the IFP. Mm -hmm. um, so is that a party ready to govern, the party that still mm -hmm. gives other people a chance? I mean, if you believe your policies mm -hmm. um, are the ones, why do you mm -hmm. allow others to contest so, on your behalf, yeah. so to speak? So here's the thing. There's going to be no game in town after the 24 election if the ANC retains their majority. So what we've started to do is work with parties where we have a common value and alignment to be able to look at how we can reduce the ANC. I fully acknowledge the DA is not going to be able to bring the ANC below 50% on its own. We're going to require other parties to work with. And that is why in the by-elections there, we stood back for the IFP and Umkamas so they could take the seat off the ANC and that worked. They stood back for us in Ward 25, Peter Maritzburg, and we were able to retain that seat. And at the same time, we didn't contest in one of their areas, and we ended up taking two seats on that night. So 
uh, it shows that where there's a maturity mm. of parties working together, we can defeat the ANC. And I'm very pleased with the maturity shown by um, Felinkosi Shlabisa, uh, leader of the IFP, who is an absolute pleasure to work with. Um, he understands the project around how we need to bring the ANC below 50% if we're going to rescue KwaZulu-Natal, but also the rest of the country from the grip of the ANC. Yeah, you've just said um, you found the DA in a terrible state. Um, so what could have been the cause of the terrible state, given that, uh, I mean, you had had, um, I mean, for the first time, a, a, a black leader, so who many people thought uh, was going to grow the party even bigger? Well, I think if uh, you look at the public record, we did an internal review. And that internal review found a number of things. There was policy incoherence. Nobody understood where the DA stood on key issues, that there was a disunity within the party, that there had been a lot of infighting and, um, and leaking to the media, that it damaged the party um, in, the, in the public eye. The party was airing its dirty, dirty linen publicly and that there was no coherent policy platform within the party. That review report set out very clearly what those problems were. We've spent the last three years repairing those. And I think today the DA is much more coherent. We're not a political weather vane. We're a, a road sign showing very clearly the way to the future. We have a wonderful policy suite that we can put before South Africans. We're going to put the finishing touches to that at Congress. And I think we've got a credible offer to make to South Africans in the next election, unlike mm -hmm. the one we had in 2019. I mean, uh, latching on to that, um We've since, since seen a number of um, other leaders, mainly black leaders, mm -hmm. and of course there, has been, there have been whites as well, mm -hmm. who have left since Musi Maimane left. Um, and then from what you are saying, to say there was incoherence, uh, and then now you are, you are obviously clear on where you're mm -hmm. going. So what does that say mm -hmm. about the DA and perhaps some of the leaders that have left? I mean, quite a number of... Uh, high profile ones? Well, I think that first of all, you've got to look at some of the individual circumstances there. And there's people who've lost internal elections and haven't got their way in structures, etc. Secondly, there were some people who got very comfortable with us being an ANC light. And obviously, as the DA's rooted itself back in its foundational values and principles, uh, it's obviously not really for them. But the reality is people come and go in politics all the time. And it's not just in the DA. We've seen recently Bongani Beloy leaving Action South Africa. We've seen in, uh, the uh, exodus there um, in KwaZulu-Natal of their entire leadership. So it happens in all political parties. People come and go. It's the values and principles that remain. And if you stick to those values and principles, yeah. I believe your party stands in much better stead of being able to provide a platform that voters look at your party and say, well, I can see what they're saying on, on these particular issues. Um, what do you say to the criticism, uh, Mr. Stenhazen, that says um, you are more worried about the, the, the core vote, um, outside the, 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 the traditional liberal vote mm -hmm. that you were losing to a party like mm -hmm. Freedom Front Plus versus what uh, Musmaiman was trying to do to try and to try and be a broad based because for any party to win um, elections in South Africa you have to have the majority of black people voting sure. for it by, by by nature of 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 how the country is is at the moment so so that criticism that uh, you actually were more worried about the the liberal traditional and then you and then you were worried that freedom front plus was eating into your base well i you know no party likes to lose their base every party has a base and you want to retain your anchor tenants, but it's not a zero-sum game where it's it's an either or. It's an and. You've got to hold on to your core base, but you have to grow. Otherwise, you're cutting off your nose to spite your face. Which is why we've gone out very determinedly into those areas where the DA has not necessarily campaigned before. Just this like, two weekends ago, I was uh, in the very rural Eastern Cape driving issues that matter to ordinary South Africans. Um, and I think that that is how you, you build um, that particular credibility out there um, with people. So I don't think that, it, I think any party would be very silly 
to simply try and hold on to their base because all that's going to lead to is a stagnation. You've got to be looking for areas to, to grow. And there is space in South Africa. There's disillusioned ANC voters. There's people who've not voted ever before. And there's others who have just simply given up on politics. So there is low hanging fruit for the DA. I also am very heartened by the latest polling, which shows that the support base of the DA is roughly in thirds, a third white, a third black and a third Indian and colored, which shows that we have by far the most diverse voter base out of any party in the country. Mm. And I take heart from that because we really want to be a party for all South Africans where people look at the party and see something of themselves represented in that party. Talking about being a part of all South Africans, um, we've been speaking to a number of people mm. and um, I think uh, your contender, mm -hmm. the contender of the very same position. Mm. Um, I think feels um, you may not be the right person to mobilize that kind of uh, <laughs> electorate uh, who can then uh, win your elections in 2024? Well, I disagree. And obviously, any candidate's entitled to put forward their particular view. Um, I, I disagree with it. I absolutely believe that South Africans are looking for leaders with experience and leaders who are able to drive issues that matter to them, yeah. which is why we've been speaking so f clearly and, and determinately on things like the cost of living, how we can reduce the cost of food to ordinary South Africans, how we can lower the food price, how we can tackle crime, how we can deal with unemployment, how we can fix load shedding, which has reached into every home. And I think many, many people are looking for a party that is solutions oriented and not only is able to put things on the table, ideas, is able to then demonstrate those through the proof points about where they're doing it, where we govern. So take yep. load shedding, for instance, what we're doing in the city of Cape Town and the Western Cape is groundbreaking. And we will be the first province and metro to be load shedding free. I have no doubt about that. And that's what's going to matter to people in this next election. Well, obviously, we will be very happy to see <laughs> load shedding and anywhere in, in mm. the country. But do you believe you are the type of a leader that will mobilize the DA, uh, the supporters, the South Africans towards that kind of a cause? Yes, for? yes, I do. I, I wouldn't be standing if, if, I, if I didn't believe that. Um, I, I believe I've got the experience, but also I believe that my style of leadership, which is to bring and build teams, it doesn't matter where I've yeah. served as a leader in Etikwene municipality, in the KwaZulu-Natal legislature, or now in parliament, very strongly focused on building teams of people who you then unleash to be able to express their talents and do what they do best in the service of the greater thrust. So when people see the DA, I don't want them to see just John Steenhuisen. I want them to see uh, Mimi Gondwe, Tandeke Mbabama, um, uh, Seviwe Garube, Loyolo Mpiti, Asho Sarupin. They must see that this is just, it's not a one man show. This is a political party that's got a team that's ready to take South Africa forward to the next level. I mean, you've led, um, obviously, at the highest level for, for the past three years. So, what would you say um, are the lessons that you've learned uh, mm -hmm. since? the tenure now that you're still seeking a second term? Well, I, I think there's a number of things that, uh, look, we, we inherited a party in a very bad way. There's very few parties in the world that survive a leader walking off the job and trashing the party on the way out. But we were able to pick up that banner and together with colleagues, we've carried it forward now to the point where we are an electoral strength yet again. Um, I would like to change a few things in the party. I think our disciplinary processes are far too drawn out and long. And I think that we could make them shorter, but fair, but swifter. Um, I think that we must continue to drive those issues that matter to ordinary South Africans and not be distracted by the stones thrown by our opponents that try and lead us down rabbit holes. So I think, it, in, I think in the past, the DA has been far too reactive to the ANC. I think that we've won the argument that the ANC is, you know, is not good at government. And people in the last local government election showed that by bringing their national, target, uh, national vote down below 50%. But we've now got to make the case far more compellingly yeah. about why we are the better alternative. And that's going to be the focus of the next 15 months. Talking about being the alternative, I think uh, mm. in the past you've been speaking about Cape Town mm. um, or Western Cape. Um, but somehow you've mm. been struggling in the municipalities here in Gauteng. Tswane, for example, we sit mm. here, we have no mayor. And then 
Johannesburg. So you once had a mayor, you have no mayor. So what has been the difficulty um, if uh, you are the alternative to the governing mm. party? Well, I think it's been the fragmentation of the vote in both those cities. If one looks at, at the array of political parties there, it makes putting together stable coalitions incredibly difficult. When you've got small one-man band parties that are not necessarily there or answerable to a big electorate or to a party congress and make decisions based on personal interest rather than what is in the best interest, you end up with situations particularly like Chwane where it's very clear that, that there's been uh, checkbook politics at play. Uh, in Johannesburg, uh, you, the demands made by some of the, of the coalition partners got to the point where we believe they were frankly unreasonable and that we could not in good conscience acquiesce to them because there's only one thing worse than not governing and that's governing and governing badly and in a way that's the antithesis to your values and principles. So coalitions are, are tough and nobody wants to go into an election you know, wanting yeah. a coalition. You want your own majority and I think we've demonstrated where we've got our own majority, Midval, um, the city of Cape Town, Umgeni municipality in KwaZulu-Natal. You're able to change and deliver far more efficiently and effectively than when you've got 10 hands on the steering wheel trying to pull it. So yes, it's been frustrating and I imagine yeah. that voters must be frustrated, but we do need to, to, to show South Africans that there are alternatives to simply accepting ANC corruption and maladministration. What has been difficult uh, with working with a party like Action SA, for example, because uh, you tend to be fishing from the same pond, mm -hmm. but somehow you, 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 you are struggling somehow to work together. What, what has been the issue there? Oh, well, I think that there's a number of issues there. I think it's a lot of the people in Action SA have come out of the DA and they carry the scars of battles past in the DA and scores still to settle with people in the DA, um, which I think is unfortunate because it distracts from our, our what should be our main purpose, which is weakening um, the, the ANC. And I welcomed the fact that Action South Africa was formed because I thought here we now have a party that can go and hunt in areas perhaps where the DA is not able to get massive votes and, and to bring the ANC below 50% because that is my goal, that's my focus is to bring the ANC below 50%. It's unfortunate in some instances the enemy has been seen as us and, and the focus is us. I don't think it helps the opposition cause shuffling the deck chairs on a Titanic between opposition parties. I think we've got to go on the hunt for disaffected voters and, and, and ANC voters particularly. And I hope that the lessons that have been learnt in the last few months and the distaste that voters are demonstrating for this sort of petty partisanship um, will be a spur to parties to be more mature and to approach these things with the unified goal in mind of us working together to reduce the ANC's uh, power. But the Action SA has been pointing the thing at you as the mm. DA to say you simply do not want to compromise. Uh, your word is your word. Well, I think that any South African voter should be very happy that a party is word is its word because we regard a deal as a deal. And when we sign a piece of paper or make an agreement or I shake somebody's hand, I want them to know that they can take that to the bank. I'm not going to do a runner when something more convenient comes along my way and or a better offer. Um, and I think we've shown very clearly that you know, when we make agreements, we stick to them. And I'm very happy to work with any party, but what I will not do is allow the DA to be dragged into situations where our values and principles are compromised. And when behavior starts to set in, that is no different from what we sought to replace when we removed the ANC from office in the first place. Is that the kind of a tendency you sometimes pick up from the Action SA? No, it's a tendency we've certainly picked up from some of the other parties, the smaller parties. But there have been some issues in, in particularly Chwane with, uh, with Action SA councillors. And that's a matter of public record. Yeah. And there have been a number of recordings yeah. that have been made and come to light. But as I said, it's not my job. Uh, my focus is not Action SA. My focus is the ANC because they're the big enemy and that's where the, that's where the target is. Yeah, but you've just said uh, you want people who will help you bring the ANC down. Mm. And then Action SA, you said you welcome it from that point yeah. of view. Exactly. But if a, a party which um, will assist you bring the ANC down, uh, you guys somehow struggle to work together, how are you going to even achieve that? Well, I, th I think there have been some teething issues, and I, and I think that they are starting to be ironed out. And I had a very good meeting with Herman Mashaba at the end of last year, where we sat and cleared the air on a number of things. And 
I really got the impression that, that there is an effort for us to be able to work together to be able to bring the ANC below 50%, regardless of what differences or scores need to be settled. I think what we need to just say is simply this. Let's forget all of those things. Those are peripheral. None of those faribbles or squabbles help us reduce the ANC's vote. Well, let's work together. We can worry about settling scores after the election. Let's focus on getting the ANC below 50% and working together to do that because there's going to be no change in South Africa if we don't achieve that one overarching goal. Is the EFF an option in the journey of trying to bring the ANC under 50? Because if you listen to the EFF itself, they're saying their main task is to get the ANC below 50. Mm. So it looks like mm. all the opposition are fighting for the same cause. So yeah. in this instance, any chance of you working with the EFF to achieve that goal? Well, the EFF are a player in the political landscape. And obviously, if they can help reduce the ANC's vote, that helps us. Where the difficulty comes in is on formal coalitions. Because I've said very clearly, right from the beginning of my leadership, and it's been the consistent guiding point, that we will work with people who share our values and principles. So if you look at those four fundamentals that we always put on the table, non-racialism, respect for the rule of law and the constitution, a market, social market economy that treats business and industry as, and the private sector as partners in growth, and building a capable state free of cater deployment and you lay the EFF seven pillars on top of those, they are incongruous in many instances. And that is what's made a governing relationship with them incredibly difficult. Now, they, without us asking, voted us into power in a number of municipalities, and we've tried to do what we could in those municipalities. But it cannot come at the price of having to turn a blind eye to wrongdoing, corruption, cater deployment, or any one of those things that violates those core values and principles. Otherwise, you end up where the ANC finds himself today in government, but completely compromised. Is that, um, are, are you basically saying, uh, whatever the circumstances, from, what, from your explanation, the EFF is not an option? Well, I don't like to count anything out, but I would say certainly from where we sit today and the EFF's current stance, and particularly when one looks at, at behavior like we saw in the, in the national shutdown and some of the threats to viol of violence and, and intimidation, um, it would make that relationship very, very difficult. But I think that what we do need to do is to see where the chips fall in 2024 and assess the situation there. But certainly, I don't regard a deal as, with the EFF as workable, given the fact that particularly on national issues, on things like expropriation without compensation, nationalization of the Reserve Bank, nationalization of mines, mm. Chavez-style economics, uh, a, a support for CADA deployment would make it very, very difficult for us to, to be in any relationship with them. Uh, and then being able mm. to govern according to our values. Let's, let's take an example. The ANC mm. dips below 50, maybe they, they go, let's say they get 40, and then the, 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 the DA is at 35, the EFF is at 16. I'm From just, your lips to God's ear. Yeah, I'm just, I'm, I'm just, uh, I'm just making um, yes, yeah. uh, this scenario quickly. And then the EFF says, oh, well, uh, we've managed to get the ANC below uh, 50. Mm. So uh, you want to be president, you want to govern the country, mm. here we are, we're offering our support. Would you take that? Well, I think we'd have to look at what the circumstances would be. Is that a coalition? Is that us getting together? And what would the what would the price tag be? Because with the John Stein Hazen is the president. Yes, Julius Malema is the deputy. Uh, I don't think I, I don't think it would be possible to work at a national level like that because what Julius Malema wants is very different to what John Stein Hazen wants. And I think getting a government coherent, stable government policy on the table on a variety of things is going to be impossible given. The, the complete incongruity with our policies and, and their policies. Maybe let's go to the <laughs> to the main to the main actor here, yeah. the ANC. Yes. Would you work with them? Well, I think there's two nightmare scenarios for South Africa post 24. The first nightmare scenario is the ANC retains a majority, but slightly, because then you'll start to see radicalism and populism setting in as they get desperate to retain that. Yeah. Basically, where Mugabe was in the early 90s. 
The second nightmare scenario is the ANC and the EFF find each other. And if one looks how extractive the EFF have been on the ANC from the opposition benches, spray pressure without compensation, drag the ANC down that rabbit hole, nationalizing the Reserve Bank, drag the ANC down that rabbit hole, I imagine they would be far more extractive on the ANC in uh, a national government where they then reliant on votes. So I think that what's going to happen in that scenario is the DA is going to have to make a decision about what is the least worst option and what is the best way for us to serve South Africa. Mm. But until we know what those chips look like, it's impossible. So I'm not, you know, I, I think it's very dangerous to, you know, to, to, to play your hand until you've seen all the cards on the table. And I think 24 is going to okay. determine that. We also have a Congress this weekend. That's okay. going no, that's to, fine. We're, yeah. we're going to go to your Congress. Uh -huh. Just. Just, I just want to get this mm. quite clearly. Mm. So, is there any possibility that you may work with a President Ramaphosa aligned ANC? Well, I've said very clearly that if we were to try and prevent, my first prize is that we bring the ANC below 50% and we're able to form something new, a new majority in South Africa. If I'm faced with the prospect of an ANC EFF alignment, the DA is going to have to think very, very carefully about what that means for South Africa and the people that have voted for us, because I imagine within 24 hours there'll be a massive disinvestment in the country. We would have to make a call then on what is the least worst option in terms of how do we save South Africa going forward. Is that a way in admission of saying perhaps the ANC could be an option? Well, I, I don't think it's saying that the ANC could be an option. I think it's what it's saying is all options are open, yes. depending on where but the... Clearly, yeah, but you see, yeah. are you trying to get me to say something uh, here that I'm, no, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm not saying? Okay. I, I'm, I'm saying to I you think that, here's my that, issue. that those are the options that we will be faced with, and we will okay. then have to make a decision yeah. about... Here's my issue, uh, uh, Mr. Stinhazen, is that you've made it clear that it would be very difficult to work with the, with the EFF. So that's yes. why I'm coming back to the ANC and saying... Mm -hmm. So then, um, then the ANC dips below 50, mm. and then the EFF says, oh, we're willing to go in with mm. you. And then the ANC says, well, DA, do you want to come with us? Mm. So that's, that's what I'm asking. Yeah, so I will you go would, for that? It would have to depend on what the circumstances would be and what the configurations were. Uh, what you don't want to do is end up like the Liberal Democrats did in the UK in coalition with the Conservative Party, where you end up being completely... Uh, shoehorned and unable to actually do anything significant in government. Yeah. So uh, it would all depend on, on what the chips look like. And that, for me, is the, the could we hold our own in an alliance with the ANC? Um, and that would depend on, on the, the vote share and the pile of chips that we've been given by the, by the electorate in, in terms of it. But uh, what I am saying to you is yeah. that we will consider all options to prevent an ANC majority or an ANC EFF type because both of those are a nightmare scenario for South Africa and for the people that we vote that vote would vote for us. Okay, no, I guess mm. uh, <laughs> I guess I understand you very well. <laughs> um, without saying it, uh, I'm sure, uh, given the scenario that you have laid out, <laughs> I don't think you are very. Uh, opposed to the ANC, not that you are... Don't going put work. words in my mouth, I'm, not, <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm just trying to, <laughs> you're trying to, to analyze. Out, you're trying to tease <laughs> out something to, to uh, okay. uh, out here. That's fine. Um, yeah. The other issue, um, the country is, um, I think the, 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 the workers really have been trying uh, to negotiate with government mm. uh, in terms of salaries, and uh, it's been a struggle, so they can't find each other. The DA is the official opposition, mm. Um, what is your take currently? I mean, should the workers be given what they deserve or should the government uh, just say, well, uh, we can't do beyond what we've yeah. tried? I think that the problem is the government's run out of money. And I think that is the bigger issue here. If the, if the revenue was increasing, if we were able to have an economy that was growing, this wouldn't be an issue because you'd be able to pay people an inflationary-based increase and it would be a matter of course. The reality is that for Minister Gondongwana, the cupboard is bare. And that's why you can talk about NHR till you're blue in the face. There's no money for it. You can talk about a basic income grant till you're blue in the face. There's no money uh, for it. And this is the same problem here with the wage bill. However, this is a consequence too of the government never grasping the nettle of the size of the civil service. And I think that our civil service as a percentage of our GDP is far too big. And one of the tough decisions facing any government coming in next year is going to be how we right size that civil service, which has become almost a political class on its own. Yeah. And 
there's going to have to be some tough decisions made because we can't be afford to be spending what we do as a percentage of GDP on the civil service, which is generally inefficient, but which is now crowding out the social spend uh, because we are paying government employees rather than spending that money on serving the people of South Africa. What is your answer to my question? Should the government refuse to go beyond what they've said? Well, well as I said to you, I don't think they can because there's no money. Um, I think in a deal world, what you want is every year to have grants going up um, linked to inflation, not just some arbitrary amount, and that you'd want your, your wage bill to go up to match inflation. That would be fair, I would say. I think it's unfair to request hyperinflationary increases, uh, as in some cases the unions demand. But there's just no money, and that's, you know, it, it becomes an academic exercise because if, if I look at the budget there, Mr. Gondongwan has got very little room to move. In the next few months, mm -hmm. South Africa will be hosting BRICS, um, a very important formation um, globally. And uh, some of the key uh, players in the BRICS formation, uh, China, Russia, India, South Africa, Brazil. And then we know that uh, you went to Ukraine uh, or Correct. just on the border. No, I went into Ukraine. Into Ukraine. I went to Kiev. Yes. Yes. So when the, the conflict started and then we, we, we now know that uh, the ICC has issued a warrant of arrest for President Putin. As the DA, as someone who is aspiring to be the president of the country beyond 2024, what would you say to South African government? Should they invite President Putin? If they do invite him, what should happen here? Well, I think that any responsible president would advise Mr. Putin given the international arrest warrant, given that we are a signatory to the Treaty of Rome, given that we have ascribed to the RCC, that he should perhaps not come. Uh, I think that would be the first thing to do. But if he does come, I think South Africa is obliged. If you say you're for the rule of law, if you say you govern in terms of the constitutional principles, you would be obliged then to execute that, that, that warrant. And I mean, our party has been consistent on this, back from the Omar al-Bashir matter, and it applies to Mr. Putin as well. If he is here, we have a legal obligation, as the court ruled back then, yeah. to execute that, that arrest warrant. So if I think that what, what if I was advising yeah. President Ramaphosa, I'd say rather let him stay in Moscow. He can send, okay. D, send Didi Mabuza to talk to him. Let's then say, we, we, we're wrapping up now, okay. um, Mr. Okay. Season. Let, let's say South Africa invites oh, uh, President Putin and then he comes. So are you not worried about the consequences of arresting him, especially because their former president, uh, Medvedev, has said whoever arrests Putin will be bombed? <laughs> well, I, I, would, I would think it would be quite fanciful if that would be the case. Um, I would, my advice is you've got to be consistent and go back to first principles. The principle of the rule of law mm. means that there's equality before the law and South Africa is obliged to execute that. We haven't left the RCC. We've remained signatories. Mr. Putin must be arrested. At the, are you sacrificing your own people, given that they well, want you, they are a superpower? It's highly they unlikely. They have nuclear weapons? It's highly unlikely that they would use those, given the consequences. Look, these are people that can barely win a war in Ukraine. They are, you know, they're on the back foot continuously. I, I, I don't think that they're a threat to South Africa. And um, I, I think that uh, it would be foolish for them to do so because I think the international consequence would be too great for them to bear. So let's but South Africa would suffer greatly, won't it? Well, I, 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 I don't <laughs> see it happening. I mean, okay. it's a, I think it's a, it's a fantasy league uh, argument because I, I don't see it, see it realistically happening. If they, yeah, I, I, well, I just don't think it's um, in the possible. <laughs> well, in the next four days, I think we'll be together um, yes. at, the, at your Congress. Mm -hmm. And of course, uh, a lot of uh, what will be happening, they will be covering. Mm -hmm. And of course, uh, we'll still chat more uh, about you. some of the issues so we can spend the entire day. I'm really looking forward to that. Right. Thank you for the interview. Well, thanks. Uh, well, that is John Steen Hazen, the, the leader of the DA, uh, who is contesting to, uh, for a second term uh, in the next four days. Uh, the DA is holding its uh, um, a Congress, and of course, uh, he's being contested by Mpopala, the former mayor of, the former mayor of Johannesburg.